When people think of charges, they think of the classic player is standing there, waiting for a bus, and then gets hit. These are the easy charges to call. And then there are some people that assume any time a defender moves his body and contact occurs, it should automatically be a block. What they do not know is that you can have a charge when the defender is moving. This is where an understanding of the cylinder principle is required. It's to help us improve our decision making on block charge plays. In addition to the defensive cylinder, FIBA incorporated an offensive cylinder this year. If you want to find out more about the different rule changes in the 2020 season, this is the video to find on our page. The first paragraph of the cylinder principle talks about the dimensions of this imaginary cylinder and that your dimensions vary according to the height and size of the player. Naturally, a bigger player is going to require a bigger cylinder. However, his parameters don't get expanded. He's just larger, so he gets a bigger cylinder. We're going to look at these parameters when we look at the offense and defensive cylinder. The parameters of your cylinder for an offensive or defensive player are virtually the same. The only difference is an offensive player has a ball in their hands. Both cylinders rear are marked by the butt. The butt is in a regular stance in line with the body. If it becomes stuck out, which is outside the cylinder, you have a potential for a personal foul. Then when we look at the sides of the cylinder, they are marked by the outer edge of the arms and legs. Your legs and feet are roughly shoulder width apart. Any big extension out of those areas will be outside your cylinder. The arms are allowed a little bit more leeway when they're looking at the position of a defender. It's slightly past the knee toe alignment. The front of the cylinder is where the variation occurs. As a defender, the hands and arms may extend in front of the torso no further than the position of the feet and knees, meaning that their hands can't go past the knee and toe alignment in front of their body. Once it does, you are now outside your cylinder. The arms are allowed to be bent at the elbow so that the forearms and hands are raised in a legal guarding position. So you can have them above in front of you as long as they're not past that alignment. The offensive player has bent knees and arms and holding the ball above the hips. The ball can go all the way to the knee toe alignment similar to the defensive player, but as soon as it goes outside that portion, you are now out of your cylinder. So yes, you can do rip through moves and do pass fakes where the ball's outside the cylinder, but you could be initiating that contact and you can be at fault of that contact when it goes outside your cylinder. And that's what we're gonna look at is when people are outside their cylinders, they can now be the ones at fault for contact. So that's why knowing the cylinders is completely important for determining offensive or defensive fouls. The defensive player may not enter the cylinder of the offensive player with the ball and cause illegal contact with the offensive player attempting to make a normal basketball play within their cylinder. So that typical Patrick Beverly head on the chest in their cylinder, this is where they're going to be at fault for contact. Because you can be in the cylinder, as this picture shows, you can be in their cylinder, but as soon as you're making illegal contact on the offensive player or restricting their movement in their cylinder, you are at fault for the contact. Because the offensive player with the ball must be allowed enough space for a normal basketball play within their cylinder. This play can include dribbling, pivoting, shooting, and passing, all the facets of the game. Now the offensive player cannot spread his legs or arms outside of his cylinder, like a push off or a kick out, and cause illegal contact with the defensive player in order to gain an additional space. So that can be an arm bar push off, that can be a Draymond Green kick out his legs on the defender. Those are all contacts that the offensive player is at fault for being outside their cylinder. To quickly look at some definitions, charging is an illegal personal contact with or without the ball by pushing or moving into an opponent's torso. It's blocking. It is illegal personal contact which impedes the progress of an opponent with or without the ball. So whether it's off ball or on ball, holding, grabbing, blocking with the knee, we're gonna look at all those. Uh, the only thing we're not gonna look at in this video is screens and that'll be saved for a different video. Legal guarding position, the last pillar that we're gonna define. Why it's important is because if they aren't in a legal guarding position, then we have a potential for a block. If they are in legal guarding position, we have a potential for an offensive foul. So before we look at the different scenarios, we need to define this last one. So a defensive player has established an initial legal guarding position 
when he is facing his opponent and have both feet on the floor. That is the base you need in order to have legal guard position. The second portion talks about your legal guard position and the cylinder extends vertically above the player. So you can raise your hand straight up above your head or even jump straight up. If you maintain that vertical position, then you're still in legal guard position. But if you jump outside of it, now you have a potential for a foul, which we'll look at later under the principle of verticality. Guarding a player who controls the ball. So when you're guarding the player who's dribbling or holding it, the elements of time and distance do not apply. The offensive player has to expect to be guarded and must be prepared to stop or change his direction whenever an opponent takes an initial legal guarding position in front of him, even if it's done within a fraction of a second. So as soon as they catch that ball and they have possession of it, they have to be expected to be guarded. The guarding defensive player must establish an initial legal guarding position without causing contact before taking his position. So they can't just step into them when they have the ball and create that contact. They have to have initial legal guarding position prior. Once the defensive player has established initial legal guarding position, he may move to guard his opponent, but can extend his arms, his shoulders, hips, or legs to prevent the dribbler from passing by them. Now to put it all together when we're judging a charge block situation, referee will use the following principles. The defensive player must establish a legal guarding position, which we looked at before, which is facing the player with the ball and having both feet on the floor. The defensive player may remain stationary, jump vertically, move laterally, or backwards in order to maintain the legal guarding position. So you can move as a defensive player and still take a charge as long as you're moving in these directions and not towards the offensive player. Like the next point says, that when moving to maintain the initial legal guarding position, one or two feet may be off the floor for an instant as long as the movement is lateral or backwards, but not towards the player with the ball because then you're causing the contact, you're going into their path. So it is expected that when you move one foot and at times both feet can be off the floor for that instant. Contact must occur on the torso, in which case the defensive player would be considered as having been at the place of contact first. So if you get hit in the hip, there's a very good chance that you weren't there in time. So that's why we talk about the torso, that if you take it in the chest, you're most likely been at the place of contact first. Lastly, when you established legal guarding position, the defensive player may turn within their cylinder to avoid injury. You can turn your body to brace for that contact and not be deemed a blocking foul. It's expected that if you need to protect yourself from injury, that you will have that right to do so. Now we're looking at the off ball situations. So when you guard a player that it doesn't have the ball, they are entitled to move freely on the playing court and take any spot that's not already occupied by another player. When this really comes into play is jamming the cutter off ball and jousting for post position. When you're guarding the post, you can move around them. As long as that's your goal is to get around and try to stop the position, but you can't push them off the spot and the offensive player can't push you off your defending spot. That is not allowed. When guarding a player who does not control the ball, the elements of time and distance will apply in this scenario. A defensive player cannot take a position so near or so quickly in the path of a moving opponent that the latter does not have the time or distance to either stop or change their direction. So you have to give them some movement uh, and some ability to stop and change direction if you occupy a spot. And that just comes in the next statement that distance is directly proportional to the speed of the opponent, but never less than one normal step. So if someone's going full speed, that's gonna be different than someone walking down the court. But at minimum, they're allowed one normal step off ball in these situations. If a defender does not respect the elements of time and distance in taking the initial legal guarding position and contact occurs, then the defender is responsible. So you'll see that a lot with Patrick Beverly. Um, he really tiptoes that line. So as long as you get to the spot first and you give that element of time and distance for them to change direction, then you should be fine. So the last paragraph is the same as guarding the ball, 
that once a defender has legal guard in position, they can move to guard the opponent. You just can't prevent them by passing by you through your arms, shoulders, hips, or legs, because then you're bumping the cutter. And you may turn within your cylinder to avoid injury. Lastly, verticality. So during the game, we know that every player has a right to occupy any position within their cylinder on the playing court that isn't occupied by an opponent. But when we look at the verticality principle, this principle protects the space on the floor which the player occupies in the space above them when they jump vertically within that space. So as someone standing there then jumping straight up, that's allowed. You're allowed to be in your cylinder, whether you're on the floor or in the air, as long as you're within that cylinder. As soon as a player leaves their cylinder and body contact occurs with an opponent who already established their own vertical position in their cylinder, the player that left their cylinder is responsible for the contact. Pretty straightforward. If you leave your cylinder, whether you're on the ground or in the air, you're at cause for the contact and you have potential for a foul. So let's look at the two different situations. If the defensive player jumps and is vertical, we can't penalize them. Even if they have their hands and arms extended above them within their own cylinder, they are fine. They aren't causing the contact. But if they reach out and leave their cylinder, now they're causing the contact and they're at fault. Now looking at the offensive player, if they are airborne or on the floor and within their cylinder, we are fine. But the scenario where the offensive player on the floor or airborne causes contact with the defensive player in a legal guard position, we have a potential for a foul. A couple of scenarios you can see is a player using their arms to create more space for themselves. So doing a push off to get a dribble shot, we've seen that. Spreading their legs or arms to cause contact during or immediately after a shot for a field goal. So we saw Draymond Green doing his leg kick. Um, this could also look at shooters that finish their shot and they kick out their legs to trip up the defender trying to make a legal play on the ball. These are all fouls that are initiated by the player leaving their cylinder. 